I'm Tom Vassell and today it's another day for a board game breakfast. I'm so excited. It's the summer. I say this every time but it's beautiful. I love summers. I love summer weather. I love all the different things that are happening. I love all the games that are being released. There's a lot going on. We think we fixed the internet problems at our house. We think. Anyway we'll find out. We're gonna be, we did some live streaming on Friday so if you missed our streaming of uh, a couple games that we played there, including uh, Mountains of Madness. You can go back and watch those. I'll be doing a live streaming from the studio here today at 4 p.m. So come back and check that out, and I'll talk to you guys then, answer your questions. But that being said, let's get started with the show, and we'll start with the news. Okay, so we have just a little bit of news this week because you're going to hear a ton in the next two weeks after that. Uh, three new Exit games are coming because the Exit games won the Kenner Spiel des Jahres. Um, uh, we have uh, Forbidden Castle, Forgotten Island, and Polar Station. Uh, in the Polar Station, you've been left behind. In the Forbidden Castle, you're visiting the castle and you get stuck in it. Those are all coming out later this year. There's a new Sonar game coming out. Um, Captain Sonar is a game that we talked about a lot from Matago. We love it. Four versus four. The new game is only two versus two. They made it, they kind of condensed it. This has me interested. I don't mind the game if it's condensed and it will look like it will hit a bigger audience. I think this will be at Target for the most part. Renegade has announced a couple more games. They just keep uh, adding more and more games. We got Kepler 3042. Uh, this is a remaking of a, Kepler, of a game Kepler from another company, a 4X exploration style game. And Dragon's Horde. This is a game that I reviewed a few years ago. A uh, really fun little light indie card game about collecting sheep as dragons. I really enjoyed it. AEG has been doing Junta. This is the, a redone version of the classic game Junta, but they now have said in November they're coming out with Junta the card game. Um, this is... I, read, I, lo I looked over the rules. They're much shorter. It's a much smaller version of Junta. And this is like a sideline in the Star Realms Kickstarter. This is the Kickstarter news, but in the Star Realms Kickstarter, they mentioned that they have the universal storage box, a gigantic box to hold everything in for Star Realms. But this will be available through retail and other places later this year. So I think people will be excited about that, even though I think it's funny that the original game came in a very small box, and now it's a big, giant box to hold everything. Okay, so... Finally, Z-Man has announced a Carcassonne Big Box version. There's many of these. This is one I think, I think this is the first Big Box for the new version of Carcassonne. It comes with the first two expansions and then nine mini expansions, a ton of stuff. I may actually get this one to kind of keep my Carcassonne stuff uh, going well. Anyway, that's the news. Let's get the Kickstarter. Happy breakfast, everybody. We've got some really cool projects to look at this week, but a couple of them end really soon, so let's get going. From the people behind Button Shy and Nevermore Games comes Spiel Press, a company dedicated to the art of the roll and write. The first campaign is for two game books, each comprised of 120 full-color perforated pages that include interactive fiction elements and can be played with standard D6s. In Star Maps, players are astronomers charting the sky. Two dice are rolled and players choose which one represents the shape you mark in and the other will be the value you put in that shape. When both shapes around a star complete, the star is discovered and the value is the difference between the surrounding shapes. There's also a tech tree element that you can advance allowing you to discover more stars. In Blood Royals, you're the legitimate heir to the crown trying to claim the throne by secretly selecting actions based on the dice, and you vie to complete areas for supporters and control. Moreover, the game is designed as a four-game campaign, so the next game has new features to manage based on the previous game. You can get a single Spiel Press book for $17 plus shipping, or both books for $30 plus shipping, and the campaign ends Tuesday. Level 99 Games is kickstarting Argent the Consortium, the second edition. In this game, you're a teacher at a powerful wizarding school, competing to swing the vote to become the new school chancellor. 
There's a lot going on in Argent with a lot of intricacies and player interaction, especially for a worker placement game. Mages have different abilities and can cast spells, manipulate time, and displace opponents. Using the right worker at the right location, considering the opponent's positions, matters a lot as you work to gain new spells, upgrade spells, and figure out what the voters are looking for in a leader. Argent has a ton of options and variability in the game between the alternate room setup, alternate powers, and the already released expansions. The second edition is largely the same with some clarified rules, but also newly recast miniatures leveraging a new base system. And there's also a new optional Festival of Masks expansion. Masks provide ongoing benefits that you can use to push your strategy forward, but you can only have one. If you already own Argent, there are options to pick up the new Masks expansion and a minis upgrade pack. But if you're new to Argent, pledge levels for the game start at $60. Catacombs Conquest is a new disc-flicking dungeon game from Elzra. This is a standalone game that uses the same system as Catacombs, but is intended as a quicker plane or entry-level version of the game. Two to four players divide into two teams and play character cards and flick character or weapons discs at your opponent's discs, trying to whittle down their life points. The game includes cardboard walls that define the battle arena, and it comes in a compact six-inch square box, making this the most portable of Catacombs games. There's also an optional playmat that fits within the arena walls for the perfect flicking surface. Catacombs Conquest features the stunning art of Quan Chai Moria, and you could get a copy for 24 Canadian dollars. Epoch the Awakening is a game of action selection and resource management, with a bit of exploration thrown in. Players are working to recompense for a life of corruption and regain lost honor before the game ends. You can work to gain the attributes of inspiration, knowledge, and strength, which can be combined into the heroic attributes of courage, vision, and wisdom. Mastered attributes gain you points. Meanwhile, you'll also be using attributes to gain companions, relics, or new abilities that can help you conquer challenges around the island. Epoch has variable game end conditions. Each game starts with two unique ones, and then more can be added or removed throughout the game. Epoch has unlocked a number of stretch goals, and you can get a base copy for a pledge of $54 plus shipping, but for just $5 more, you can get the swanky level, which includes all those stretch goals and bonuses. And last but not least, Numeracy Legends is a series of board games designed for children between the ages of 4 and 10 that was originally released in Taiwan, but it's making its way to a wider audience via Kickstarter. Each Numeracy Legend game shares a cast of adorable characters from the team of heroes to that naughty gluttony dragon, mischievous fox, and dapper unicorn. And there are a ton of treat tokens. But more than just cute for cute's sake, the Numeracy Legends games are each founded in specific mathematical and game theory principles. In Rainbow Unicorn, you learn pathing as you race to collect ingredient tokens to get to the magic well to win the cupcake. In Zerta Fox, you learn to count cards and the basics of probability, and you use memory skills as you work to deliver cupcakes by finding the best way to the destination table. And in Gluttony Dragon, the team works together to fend off the angry Gluttony Dragon from ruining the party by optimizing tactical choices. My 5 and 8 year old have been having fun with these games for months. The components are high quality, the art is charming and cute, and the play is engaging enough for grown-ups to enjoy with the kids. You can get all three games for a pledge of $84 plus shipping. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Remember, a few of those projects end this week, so if they caught your eye, go take a look right away. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Jazz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here, letting you know that the rumors are true. Several days ago, in the midst of a video debating the merit of board game inserts for storing and organizing components versus plastic bags, a third option was raised by a viewer, that of plastic boxes, such as those used for fishing tackle or the much-loved Plano box. Well, intrigued, I responded with the following. If there is this secret society of plastic container board gamers, 
Please let me into your society. Well, soon thereafter, video viewer and knower of things, Jason M., revealed to me a heretofore unknown mini-society that congregates deep inside the internet pages of Board Game Geek to discuss this very thing. These people are also enamored with Plano boxes, and they compare notes on which models of plastic containers work best with a variety of board games. In fact, as of the time of this recording, this community's list of Plano to board game pairings spans 11 pages, listing roughly 275 games and their plastic box storage counterparts. Everything from Seven Wonders to a game that may or may not be pronounced Isfahan, and everything in between. Will the presence of this new community incite a civil war between board gamers who prefer Plano boxes and users of third-party wooden inserts? Well, for the answer to those questions, we go now to a Pair of Dice Paradise Emergency Special Report. A Pair of Dice Paradise Emergency Special Report. This has been a Pair of Dice Paradise Emergency Special Report. So, if you, like me, are a cardboard component container connoisseur, you can find a link to this Board Game Geek Plano Box recommendation list either in the description below this video, or right here on your screen this very moment. As long as the editing department still isn't mad at me for selling all their lunches so I could go and purchase the latest Ryan Lockett game. <laughs> Ah. So, if you are a Plano Box fan, be sure to check out this list. And if you've already been using plastic containers for your board games, what kind do you use and where do you get yours from? Uh, specialty shops or stores that sell sporting goods or crafts or even the storage sections of big box retailers? Let me know in the comments below, because really, now that I know that oh, this is an option, my coveting of component containers is a condition that just cannot be cured. <sighs> that can't be cured either, can it? Okay, so what's coming out from the Dice Tower this week? Well, we're going to be taking a look at some games. Uh, Mountains of Madness, we'll be reviewing that. Miami Dice, as well as Caverna Cave vs. Cave. Uh, Melody and I will be taking a look at the Leaders of Euphoria. Well, you'll see several reviews from me and Melody. We have a new Wrath Scourge table that we're using for playthroughs. We'll be doing a review of that. And we might even do a couple more playthroughs this week. It all depends on the timing and stuff. Although we are going to be working a little bit more at continuing to work on the new studio that we have. Uh, a new Dice Tower is going up this week, uh, best of Gen Con 2017, or at least what we're looking forward to, where it will be me and Eric, and we're joined by Jamie from Secret Cabal, so we'll be talking about that. That's coming out Tuesday, and of course, lots of other podcasts in the Dice Tower Network, all of those on our channel. You can find them at DiceTowerNetwork.com. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game series of Exit the Game. Now, the Exit Game series is very unique and different because it simulates an escape the room system where you're trying to solve riddles in order to proceed and eventually escape or win the game. So, let me show you a little bit about the game without spoiling anything and then show you my thoughts at the end. Based on what's inside the box, every game is going to come with a clue book, along with an encoder that you're going to use, along with a riddle deck, an answer deck, and a help deck. You're going to use your book and your riddle cards in order to figure out clues to apply them in your encoder. Based on that, those clues and the symbols, it will give you an answer card to draw from. You will go ahead and draw from the answer card and you will check and see if you are correct or not. If you ever get stuck, you are more than welcome to check the help card deck. The help card deck will offer you small little clues just to kind of push you along throughout the game. When you're done with the game, you can check and see how well you did. For example, you can check and see how many help cards you used along with how long it took you to play the game. And then you can check and see how many stars you were awarded. 
So as you can see, the Exit game series is fairly unique and different because you have these riddle cards along with a book and you're trying to solve these clues in order to find a code to proceed. Now you're using the encoder along with the answer cards to figure out if you're right or wrong. And that's what I really like about this game system because it has a double check system in itself. So that's why I really enjoy Exit the Game series. Well, thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. All right, so this is Herd Your Horses. In this game, you're gonna be getting you and your herd from the ranch all the way safely to Green River Valley. You need a total of nine mares and mares with foals. You don't start with nine, so how do you get more? If you land on a ranch horse spot, you get to grab a ranch horse. If you land on a Mustang horse spot, you get a Mustang. And you can also land on an adventure card spot. If you play a bachelor stallion on another player, you get to take one of their mares and they're going out of the game and starting their own herd. The first player to get to Green River Valley wins. So that was Pew! Herd your horses. So this again is your typical like roll and move old thrift store games. Yeah. But that being said, I really like it. It's super charming, you guys. If you had like a son or a daughter who's like really into horses, you would be playing this game every single day Dude. for the rest of your life. And I like the fact that it lets kids face harsh things like tragedy early on. There are adventure cards where it says, hey, there's a drought, there's not much water. You lose a card. You get rid of one. We know. What happens there? You know what happened to Sparkles. I really like like all the different mares. I really yeah. like these like bachelor stallions. Yeah, bachelor stallions. Yeah, like bachelor stallions. Four stallions, two sugar cubes. Who will be selected? This is the Bachelorette Stallion Edition. You know, I just don't get what she sees in Twilight. I mean, the guy thinks he's like, Head stallion. You know what? I think he's part donkey. I really think he's part donkey. I don't care who knows it. What do you say? <laughs> Jealousy's an ugly face, Greg. <laughs> Go eat some oats about it. <laughs> yeah, man, I don't know why she messes around with those other horses, man. There's only one stud, and it's right here. Pew, true buck and bronco. Got two tickets to the rodeo. Right here for VIP. Very important pony. Let them preen and prance as much as they want. They'll all be glue before long. Honestly, I don't know about any of these guys. They all think they're hot stuff and big stallions. And you know what? I'm just here trying to do right by me and my foal. Can't wait to see you next week. <laughs> Who's getting the sugar cube? So hit us up on all forms of social media. Uh, we love hearing from- They're right there! <laughs> Until next week, we'll see you at the thrift store. See you on the ranch, brother. What's the difference between Pathfinder and D&D? &D? Hi, I'm Chris Renshaw from the Boards and Swords podcast, and welcome to Role Playing. Two companies have been responsible for producing the Dungeons and Dragons role playing game. First being TSR, which was formed by Gary Gygax when he originally put out and revised the rules that eventually became known as First Edition D&D. Then in the 80s, they went and revised them and came out with what they called Second Edition. Wizards of the Coast bought TSR and everything that they owned, including Dungeons and & Dragons, and came out with their own edition of D&D, calling it 3rd Edition, and revising the rules later on and calling them 3.5, where it was the same rule set with a few minor tweaks. However, about eight years later, they decided to abandon 3.5 and came out with a new edition called 4th Edition. Now, 4th Edition was a very different edition of D and D. A lot of people criticized it for having too much emphasis on powers and miniatures-based combat. Enter the company Paizo. Now, Paizo had been making D and D-related uh, adventures and guides and publishing for a couple of years. They decided, well, we still enjoy the three-five rule set, but there are problems with the game, so they tweaked it and put their own spin on those rules and came out with the Pathfinder role-playing game. But it is still fairly compatible. So if you have, if you ever enjoyed D&D 3rd Edition, then most of your stuff will still work and easily convert over to Pathfinder. What editions of D&D have you played over the years? Let me know down in the comments below. And in the meantime, may all your hits be crits. 
Now folks, I'm a big fan of board games. I especially like board games in a family setting. They're great to play with kids, they're great to play with other people. That's the great thing about board games. I'm especially interested in using board games to help with disabilities and things. I, I found it fascinating. There's Kickstarters for people who uh, are blind and how they can play board games and other things. I have a daughter, Claire, and I've had Claire on the show in the past before. Claire has some learning disabilities, and she is working through those, and we're working with her, but she is certainly several years behind. But it's exciting for me to see the things that she can do with games. And if you see my review of Robot Turtles, you'll see how excited I am to see the kind of games that she can be involved with, even if she's not as you know up to par mentally as everyone else is. But it doesn't, in, in many different ways, if people have any kind of sort of handicaps, they're there's ways that they can be involved with board gaming. And because of that, I want to show you here, I'm just gonna, I'm, this is the end of Tom Thinks part, but Mike is starting up, uh, my friend Mike from Canada is starting up an initiative on this regard. And he sent me his video, Mike has done a, 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 a podcast about the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund, uh, that it's really good, we posted it in our own feed. But he's starting a new initiative here and I thought you guys would like to see this, so we're gonna show it here on our channel now and I'll let this speak for itself. My name is Mike, and like most husbands and fathers, I feel very lucky for the family that I have. And like all families, you hope that life is going to bring a lot of memorable moments. Oh, what's that, baby? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> he's got his eyes open. <laughs> Lukey loves peas. He loves sweet peas. Sometimes life can take a turn of sorts. And for us, it was in January 2017 when my son Luke was diagnosed with autism. At the time of his diagnosis, my wife and I didn't really know what kind of road this was going to pose for our son. But it didn't take long to realize that finding him the support he was going to need to put his best foot forward was going to be a key factor in all of this. I mean, what parent doesn't want their child to be able to engage with their surroundings, even if it's at the most rudimentary level. Now, I'm a kid at heart. I love my board games. I love my pinball. And it didn't take long to realize that my passions were actually beginning to have this really wonderful impact on my son. Okay, in the movie theater, great. Oh, I did you did, you did do it. <laughs> what started out as not even being able to go into a restaurant because he would scream at strangers, we would have to leave. It's begun to turn into a situation now where Luke can enjoy his surroundings most of the time. And for that, we're really thankful because we know now that for some families, that doesn't come quite as easy. Oh, oh. Whoa, what do you get? Apple. 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 Mommy too? Mommy too? Apple. 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 My wife and I realized that our challenges are definitely not as daunting as what some other parents are facing. And so we decided to use some of our energy to try an idea and share our passion of gaming with others in a rather unique way. Hey guys, come on in. Tyler, how are you buddy? Good. Come on in. We invited a number of families into our home for a family game day to play pinball and board games. And for the younger kids, we had this eclectic collection of toys that Luke had been growing up with. Some of the kids who came over had special needs, but there were some others who didn't. And the point of the day was to demonstrate that play can help kids to connect with each other and their environment, no matter who they are or what challenges they might have in their life. It was an amazing experience to share games with people this way. Hey, hey, there you go, Atticus, good boy. Nice shot. This day spoke volumes about what the world of play can do. And what has now come out of this is a very special not-for-profit initiative called Path of Play. It's a big project and it has really big goals. 
So on December 2nd, 2017, our first gaming marathon is going to happen, and we need 3,000 board game, pinball, and video game players to join us for our live stream of this really amazing event. Our end goal is to build our own facility that uses the world of play on a daily basis to bridge the gap of inclusion and help all of us become more empathetic, more understanding, and more accepting to the challenges that some of these kids with special needs face. This to me is what the Path of Play project will set out to do. And it's my hope that everyone out there will join us on this amazing journey because there's no denying that when we play, we connect. In Tiny Epic Quest, one to four players are going to send out their three adventurers all across the land in an attempt to complete quests and therefore gain victory points. This is done over two phases. In the day phase, you're going to be choosing one of five different movement methods to move all across the land. Perhaps you'll fight a goblin. Perhaps you will visit a mushroom grotto. Perhaps you'll explore a temple. Or you may even want to learn a spell. All of these in an attempt to complete quests. In the night phase, you're going to roll dice in a push your luck fashion. Maybe one of these quests will allow you to gain an item off of the item rack or even off of your player board, a legendary item that you could then use to equip your hero, making him even more powerful and have some unique abilities. In Tiny Epic Quest, the most brave adventurers in all the land will be the ones that gain the most victory points. On this episode with Shaggate, we have a brand new gamer who's getting ready to find out the fate of where they belong in this gaming world. So, let's go ahead and start. Hi, I'm Gary Pope and this is Late to the Table where we go on the board game subreddit and we look at the daily game personalized recommendation. I'm going to get that thing wrong every single week and we recommend games for people to play. So, let's go ahead and start. Yen01234 just recently played Scythe, Catan, and Ticket to Ride and they just really like how they could think during other players' turns and then do those actions during their turn. So, they're looking for recommendations. I'd say congrats Yen01234. There's been two warring factions over generations trying to figure out who has the least annoying players and it looks like the sorting hat just picked out who you belong with. Ah, right then. Mm, right. Okay. Eurogamer! So what does that mean that now you've been selected as a Eurogamer? Well, you get to enjoy these finer things in life. Well, you get to enjoy games that have a high amount of replayability because they all just seem to be so broken those first couple times you play it. So you gotta play it again to figure out how the designer miss this? How did a designer play this game hundreds of times and not realize that throwing it in the trash gives you the most amount of points? It's like you didn't read the rule book. You also get your own little personal bubble, which if anyone so much as approaches your territory, they get the worst punishment of all, death by points. Salad. Did someone say points? Points! Yeah, you'll get a ton of them for doing just about anything. Did you just move? Here, have some points. Did you just draw a card? Have some more points. Did you just roll a dice? No, dice out of form of randomness. We're not having that in these type of games. Did you just throw away the game? Well, it looks like you just won the game. No, seriously, how did the designers miss that flaw? But Yen, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, what game should you be playing? So for this, we're going to suggest a classic, which is Stone Age, which has dice rolls. Also, if you want to check out the cult of the new go at Terraforming Mars. And if you really liked math class growing up, you should definitely check out Power Grid. And that was another episode of What Should I Get? Be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendation thing that's posted on a daily basis at this point. And thanks for watching. Hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Is it over?
Hey everyone, it's lunchtime! So today we're taking a look at the game called Dreams. Woo. It was designed by Olivier Gregoire. It was published by Zuck Zum Spielen. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It plays for ages 10 and up, 3 to 6 players in about 30 minutes. So the idea is you are gods, but there is a mortal among you and you're trying to figure out who they are. There are images that you're creating in people's dreams. And the gods all know what it is based on grabbing uh, one of the tokens. They're going to know that it's number three. The mortal, however, is going to know nothing. So they're going to be bluffing their way through as we play our stars out to basically try to complete this image in a constellation form. So we're trying to make this beautiful art, trying to figure out if we can get who the mortal is. But the mortal is also trying to guess which is the true image of the gods. So after all the players have played out their stars, they have these three different types of colors of stars, then we're going to, as gods, we're going to say, hmm, I think orange might be the mortal, so we'll choose a color. The mortal, however, is trying to guess which is the right image, so they're going to pick a number, because they might guess based on our information. That number three is correct. We all reveal. If the gods guess who is correct, they get points. And if other gods don't guess them, because they were able to say, well, I'm a god, then they also get points for that. Now, the mortal will get points if they guess it correctly, or, and if no one guesses them as the mortal. This game is tricky. I like it though. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Fake Artist Goes to New York. A similar concept, but with constellations. So It's got nice big cards, beautiful art on the cards, and a, a fair stack of them to choose from as well. So Yeah, we were thinking maybe you can switch in some like Dixit ones, but I think it might be kind of hard. Ooh, they, they're a little bit more, less less obvious than yeah. these ones. Dixit or Mysterium, but yeah, yeah then they would get very subtle. They would. And I am not a bluffing fan. <laughs> I will admit, I do not do bluffing games, and this one had me pretty much in the get-go. We were laughing all the way through. So much fun. It was great. Really enjoyed it at higher numbers. Still scale. It still plays well at three, but six mm -hmm. was fantastic. So yeah. definitely play this one again. Yeah. All right, so I guess that's it for now. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. So today we're looking at an insert. This is from Meeple Realty for a feast for Odin. So this insert has been put together uh, by Melody uh, because... So in this, you can see we have these two cases here. These have lids that come on and off and they're shaped like axes with the bendable wood that Meeple Realty does well. And these keep track of the coins that you have. So these here are placed on the outside around these smaller boards and then Inside, we have a place to put all the cards. So you have that build here. We have some spots here to keep the different resources in the game. We have this here for all the different tiles, fits them with spots on the side to grab the tiles out, very easy. And then we have this first player marker. This is kind of superfluous, but it does look neat and it fits there. And then we have these small boxes here. These have a lid on them and they basically are there to keep all your little workers. That's pretty much all you need for this one because the game already came with its own inserts for the tiles. So all this fits in the box like this. Now it did take a while for all this to get in here. Uh, Melody spent a couple hours putting this together. I love Meeple Realty stuff, but realize there is a lot of putting these together, a lot of banging uh, the different p components and stuff together. But when it gets put inside the box, the whole thing just has a really nice look to it. So that's the Meeple Realty insert for A Feast for Odin. Welcome in the land of the sins. And in the land of the sins, we are talking about Mia Culpa, my best and my worst. Watch it now. My favorite part of Mea Culpa is definitely the theme. Who not wants to be get into the heaven and always struggles to get closer to the hell in life? I mean, we all do some sins and that's what the game is all about. And we are getting closer and closer to the negative side. And only at the end of the game, when you have enough... Uh, when you prayed enough, you are getting closer to heaven. What a wonderful story. And if that would be not enough, I will read out some special variant rule. From now on, let a sin be called a sin. That is the only rule, a variant that is really cool. From now on, when you are taking back a, a turn or correct a turn and someone is calling you out, okay, put a little disc into the little sins here and then redo it 
or for an example if you take your character card before you pay so for all these little sins that everybody don't like during play oh i'm taking that back you have to pay a little disc in the little sins isn't that nice yeah the part that i don't like is simply there's nothing really standing out in this game beside the theme. So you are doing this, you are trading, you are buying, you are selling, you have a king that builds here buildings, and all of that feels... Then you're going into other houses, take this action. It feels so normal. There's nothing really... Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the game, but there's nothing that really stands out beside this cool theme. Yeah, heaven or hell. That is the question, Mea Culpa from Zoch Games. See you next week here on the Board Game Breakfast. Niels, Cyril's Brettspiele, and then a different game. As always, bye bye. All right, so what's on the shelf this week? So, um, obviously, a piece of cardboard. All right, so here we have 10 Days in Africa. I love the 10 Day series. But due to space constraints, I finally decided to get rid of them, but I want to keep one. So I kept Africa, mostly because it's the continent I know the least about, and so I like that. I don't know, there's something to it that I find interesting. Uh, underneath here is Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space. It's hard to see uh, the black box, but it's from Osprey Games. A great job on the reprint here. Love this game. Casting. This is a silly game in which you are casting people for different roles, and trying to get them to trying to get someone to pick your person or looking for a specific person and you're trying to get that castles of calendar oh this is a game and it's like kind of like carcassonne where you're putting together a huge castle and really like the way this one looks unusual suspects which casting has a lot of similarities to the very similar games as you try to get people to eliminate folks based on outward appearances something that's really bad in real life but we allow in a game over here we have Liar's Dice, which is just a fantastic game. Kemble's Cascade, which I keep partially because I like the game, but also just I love the idea. This is an arcade game. This is, you know, a Space Invaders, the board game. Uh, then we have My Happy Farm, which is a game about stretchy pigs and things. A lot of fun. Dragon's Gold, one of my favorite games of all time, as you have to make deals within one minute. Queen's Necklace, which is a great card game. As you are trying to, it's basically based in the Three Musketeers universe, really like that one. And then Seven Card Slugfest, which is a game of playing cards as fast as you can on different piles. And I don't normally like games like that, but this one I like a lot. It's asymmetrical and just a lot of fun. Small, weird games, they don't get played as much on these shelves as other ones, but still like them a lot. And that's what's on the shelf this week. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Maker. Today I'd like to talk to you about a very serious subject regarding board games. Have you ever been accused of being a board game hoarder? <laughs> now of course that's crazy talk. There's no such thing as a board game hoarder because you can't have too many board games. I keep my collection about 100, maybe a few over, whatever I can fit on my shelf. But I also have a board game component collection. Now I'm not talking about board game components as in like collecting certain components from board games. I'm talking about all the components that I find at the Goodwill, at the craft store, at wherever I find them, in even other board games. I take them out, I put them into baggies in hopes of using them someday. That's kind of what a hoarder does, but I will use mine someday. See this is my collection. I have this bookcase full of components. This is where I store my components that I most use, but then this is my storage room. This is where I put things into bins. And those bins are put onto shelves. And the shelves are put into the storage room, which is both inside and outside. Most of them, I actually do write something on the bin of what's inside of it, but many I don't. Do you hoard components? If you go to the thrift store and find stuff, do you take out parts that you think might fit in a board game someday? How much is too much? Lots of different types of answers. Just giving you some component food for thought. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I'll see you next time. Hello, my name's Dan and this is Cora and we're here today to talk to you about kids games for children of around five and under. 
And today we're going to talk about this game, aren't we, Cora? What is it? Cthulhu Wars. Cthulhu Wars. Now, one of the best things about this game is the miniatures. They're really good and they're really. Hmm. Mm, kind of monsterish. Monsterish. But they, they don't look very good not painted, do they? No, they're just all one colour. All one colour. I think we should paint them. What do you think? Yeah, paint them before I play them. We're going to paint these before we play them. Grey, 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 I'm painting them with grey, grey, grey. I'll just take off Got some more colour. On the screen. On the grey. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Just as long as they can take it so much. Wait, 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 wait. Cora? I'm not sure that's quite right. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think I'm going to have to get some advice. Okay, hang on. Mm -hmm. Hello? Hi, hi, is that Rob? Yeah. I could do with a bit of help. Oh, what could that be? Hello? Yes, this is. Hey, Dan, how you doing? What are you doing? You're painting Cthulhu Wars. And you don't like how it's coming out. And you sent me some pictures. Okay, let me take a look. Hang on. Do me a favor. Put Cora on. Hello, Cora. Do me a favor. Um, take those paint bottles away from your father. And uh, do me a favor, follow me over to my segment, and uh, let's see if we can fix this. All right? I'll see you guys in a little bit. I've been to a few conventions now, and if there's one thing I've learned other than deodorant, toothpaste, and a secret sandwich, absolutely schedule as few things as possible. Obviously, meeting for lunch or meeting outside the convention centre at 7 o'clock to go murdering or fidget spinning or whatever the kids are doing nowadays. Probably something to do with slime. What is that about? But like how they left Stargate Atlantis, scheduling at a con is an absolute nightmare. I said yes a couple of times when I really should have said if we get chance. I asked a mate if we could sit down so he could teach me Star Wars Destiny because I need something else to burn my money on. And I was meant to have a game of Mission Red Planet, finally. And both of those things never happened, which kind of made me feel like a bad person. I was free, then they were free, then I wasn't free, then they were halfway through a game or something that was gonna last a week. It's just how conventions work. So, the moral of the story is that my number one top tip for conventions is don't schedule anything, if you can help it. Also, water, clean socks, a multivitamin, and don't use your credit card, because that's just asking for trouble. See you next week. So hi everyone, obviously Dan and Cora are having a bit of a problem. What they want to do is kind of get this without squirting bottles all over it. I don't know what Dan was thinking, but you actually have to use a brush. So let's keep it simple because it takes a little practice to get things to this kind of quality and it looks like they're just starting off and sometimes simple is a lot better. So what we're going to have Dan and Cora do is just spray paint them white and just put a nice wash on there. Just bring out the detail of the model. First of all, it'll be fun, it's not intimidating, and it actually looks good at the end. So, let's see how they make out and how they do it. Let's take a look. Well, as you can see, I think they did a great job.
So, without further ado, why don't we let those two guys close out this show? And they did a wonderful job. Great job, guys. Thanks, Rob. So, Cora, did you enjoy painting these miniatures? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's lucky, because we've got all these to do now. Right, I'm off to play Super Mario Kart. You get on with this. And that is it for another board game breakfast. Guys, thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate you coming around uh, each week. Thank you again to the contributors for doing a great job. If you want to talk live Q&A at 4 o'clock today, happy birthday to Derek, our wonderful editor. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.